So thank you, Goretti, and it's all yours. Yeah, thank you. So thank you everyone for coming. And like Marta said, um, I'd like to talk to you today about authentic texts, but also like the questions that we generally, I think it's a fairly, fairly uh, common occurrence that we, we come up with questions to go with our texts and that we try to sort of like uh, work on reading comprehension with our students. Um, and in fact, the, the use of authentic texts, I mean, I think it's very widespread whether you are um, in any way wanting to adhere to ACTFL or not. I think by this point, the communicative language approach has made it um, common knowledge that authentic texts are recommended and probably should be favored. Uh, but definitely um, organizations such as uh, ACTFL um, are proactive about recommending that we use such texts. And when we wonder why, or when we want to know, know why, I mean, essentially, you actually will tell you that it's because they're more realistic, right? If you're trying to prepare your students for something that may happen to them in a real linguistic interaction, maybe using an authentic text, namely something that was created by native speakers of a language um, with native speakers of that language in mind, as opposed to second language learners of that language in mind, uh, that's maybe the end goal. And, and for that reason, you should be incorporating in your, in your instruction. Um, so if we go to, to the uh, second language acquisition literature, I think every time authentic texts are sort of like brought up, um, then the uh, mention is that they are realistic discourse samples. So again, along the same lines, you know, if you're trying to prepare your students to be more communicatively competent, maybe you should be exposing them to texts that are real, you know, actual examples of what uh, those interactions will look like. So forgive me, because I think a bunch of people here is not, are not gonna speak Spanish. So bear with me, please. This is an authentic text in, in Spanish and I'm providing the translation here. Um, it's, it's, I'm sure it's been a long day. So if you take a cat nap while I read, I won't hold it against you. But um, if you can, um, this text is about um, sports uh, and sports as a means of combating stress for students. So essentially what this says is among students who spend long hours in class and the library, sport is in recent times, one of the more popular options to combat stress, okay? Of all sports related activities, running is perhaps the most convenient because it can be practiced outside or in the gym. Um, and at an amateur, amateur level, you don't need much technique. And then the final paragraph, another very frequent exercise is dancing. Obviously, we're not referring to ballet, a perfect modality to promote teamwork and discipline, but that requires a level of dedication incompatible with studies. We're referring to, for example, those that happen in Zumba or hip hop sessions. This is an abridged version of something that we're like um, using now. And again, it is it was taken from, from a source sort of like verbatim and um, as you can see already in the translation, and, and what, what I would like to do now is sort of go a little bit through some of the uh, features that we find in this text, because I think they're representative of what you find in authentic texts. And, and they are things that normally we have to do something about, right? We wanna use authentic texts, but it's hardly ever the case that we can grab one and take it as it is, as we find it in its source and put it in front of our students. The reason why there's some work in, in the middle um, is, for example, that oftentimes in authentic texts, we don't follow the subject, verb, object sequence. We don't see that being followed. That is really not always how um, natives talk. And in fact, in, in our example here, we see that the text opens with amongst students who spend long hours in class in the library. And then only then, after all of that, you know, text, you find the subject of your sentence, which would be el deporte, right? So sports. And so that is also something that we see in the second paragraph with that of all, of all sports related activities that happens again. So that deviation from 
the subject verb object sequence that is definitely going to be favored by language learners in general but 100% going to be the favorite or the expectation from native speakers of English uh, where that word order is just most always the case. Um, and then another thing that we could tend to find in authentic texts that sometimes we have to do something about are appositives, right? So things like of all sports related activities is uh, running is perhaps, we don't need that there, but we find that we do a lot of that in, in uh, native discourse, right? We add some more information that the sentence would be completely grammatical without, but that we wanna add for nuance. It happens again later in the paragraph, you can practice it, practice it um, at, uh, and at an amateur level, again, that is not information you need for the, for the sentence to be correct, but that happens a lot in native discourse. Um, so you have that in authentic texts, we deviate from the subject verb object sequence frequently, and then we have a positives. Okay, perfect. We also have references, right? So uh, we're talking about running here. And then later in that paragraph is like this activity. You know, that taxes your students more in that they have to realize that this activity refers to something mentioned before. They have to identify what that reference is tied to. And then they have to identify that all of these that comes next ties to this, which in turn ties to all of that. So now suddenly that authentic text is requiring comprehension at the paragraph level. Okay, um, and this is very, very common. Okay, in this case, it's not even such a bad reference because esta actividad, right, this activity is referring to something you've already mentioned. But oftentimes we have what we call a cataphoric reference, which is like something that is going to be tied to a reference that we haven't yet mentioned. All of these things are items that we generally need to grapple with when we try to use an authentic text. And so we're at the third paragraph where Again, we see another thing that tends to require intervention in authentic texts. This text talks about ballet not being like a suitable activity if you wanna sort of like um, get rid of stress and you're a student, which bears on plausibility. We're gonna find that this information probably neither confirms or disconfirms something that our students know. They just don't have any knowledge about that. So they don't have that additional sort of world knowledge to help them with comprehension. This is not even such a bad example in that at least it doesn't tell them something that rounds counter to knowledge they may have. So it's not entirely counterintuitive, it's just kind of neutral. But again, it's something that authentic texts often require us to contend with. This information is not necessarily gonna resonate with my students. So how do I incorporate this that everyone recommends I expose my students to, but um, without sacrificing comprehension completely. Now, and here we have another appositive. I won't like dwell too much on it, but it's like long story short, there are a number of features in authentic texts that again, we know as instructors require intervention because otherwise that text is untenable for our students to digest or to assimilate. Now, I feel like it is fairly um, common for us to sort of like, go, oh, this is gonna make my students unhappy. They're not gonna understand. So you can, in the face of that, take an attitude of no prisoners, you know, that doesn't matter. Whatever they're not gonna understand, I'm just gonna take out. So you take that a positive or that um, um, deviation from the subject verb object um, sequence is like throw it out of the window or you know in in all cases like anything that that is way too much information a positives and then deviation take that out if you want you can do that you can but I feel like that that then this is what you would end up with, right? Visually, you can already see that you've gone from a longer text to a shorter text. I think that whether it is because you've, uh, I don't know, whether, whether it is because you are familiar with Axel or whether it is because you consume second language acquisition literature or whether it is because you've developed an instinct as an instructor, as a practitioner or because you talk to your colleagues, I feel like for, for all of us, you look at this simplified version and something, it makes you somewhat uncomfortable, right? Maybe you took out a bunch of things there, 
that um, make your text no longer quite so authentic, if authentic at all. Um, so your students are maybe going to be happy, but maybe you just took something that had a lot of value to provide your students with a chance at becoming more communicatively competent, but maybe you just turned it into an unrealistic discourse sample. And so I feel like we're all fairly, fairly on par at that level. I feel like no one would probably take that no prisoner, take no prisoner's attitude and just like take all of these elements that are gonna pose a problem, turn the text into something short, succinct, that my students can understand. It kind of defeats the purpose. And I think we all feel that on some, on some level. And so, in fact, if we go to the SLA literature, seminal studies that have uh, empirically looked at this, they have compared students that were exposed to simplified versus non-simplified texts. They, they, they did find that sometimes um, comprehension was better with uh, simplified texts, but they also concluded that elements that our students need to know about were not there anymore. So at that point, you know, what's the, there's a question as to whether that is a, a good idea or not. And so we have that probably the most quoted study about this from the 90s um, mentioned that simplified texts uh, do away with elements that, uh, that students need to, to then navigate uh, real linguistic interactions. Whether you know this from Yano Long and Ross or whether you know this because it was your gut feeling, Again, I think this is something that, that we all share. But then the idea, sometimes I, I just feel like people want to be so faithful and loyal to, to that authentic text that they don't wanna touch it at all. And that doesn't work either. Um, and so if you go to something like Yano, Long and Ross, or if you go to the uh, applied linguistics literature, oftentimes what they suggest as an alternative is that you elaborate it. These two I find is relatively intuitive. I find that instructors are like, well, okay, saving exceptions. Some people don't wanna touch the authentic text at all. But I mean, for the most part, I feel like people uh, would be semi-comfortable with Yes, doing some simplification, maybe some items do go out from that text. And then you just include some redundancy. That is, if you think that something is gonna be difficult to understand, maybe you provide an additional chance, either by way of a synonym or a phrase that is probably not 100% necessary, but provides an additional opportunity for your student to confirm that they're understanding properly. So, or maybe you rephrase something, or maybe you kind of like avoid overusing pronouns and you opt for mentioning things overtly rather than referring to them through pronominal use. And again, I feel like this is fairly intuitive, whether it is because you've informed yourself formally um, and you know, for example, from the literature that elaborated texts support comprehensibility without adding to difficulty, despite sometimes have a greater length, right? It is the case here. I feel like we also all do this. We end up doing this, whether it is because we read about it, because we have a gut feeling about it. Okay, perfect. So then we're like, ta-da, I did great. Look at me, I have an authentic text. Um, this is rich or richer input than definitely the simplified version or the canned texts that we sometimes find in commercial um, textbooks. And so we're, you know, there's a certain degree of satisfaction with ourselves and our performance. That's fine. Mission accomplished. You're fine. And so you fly home and you like have free time in the evening, set no teacher ever. Um, and so, but here's a number of things that we know about SLA. Um, rich input is a must. So this goes back to that idea of like, yeah, I mean, good. You have an authentic text you elaborated it a little bit, so there were some sacrifices made probably, but you modified that text in a way that provided more language input rather than less language input. And, and in doing so, you probably left the features there that you want your students to learn. Okay, wonderful. The fact that rich input is necessary for language acquisition to happen is not a new idea. I mean, Crafton mentioned it with the notion of comprehensible input, Michael Long, Gas, and a million people. This is probably the only thing that people in SLA literature agree upon. Input is necessary. If, if you don't have any input, you're not gonna continue developing in your, in your second language learning. Okay, 
But then we also know um, that input is not the same as intake and is not the same as uptake. That is only a subset of the input that, that you expose your students to is going to be understood. We call that intake, okay? So if you present input, a subset of that is comprehended. Okay, perfect, intake. Only a subset of that intake will be learned, uptake, okay? So there's gonna be a certain entropy, right? You present a lot and then a portion of that, if all goes well, um, will be learned. We also know that uptake, you know, whatever is, is learned requires a certain degree of attention. So you can't, you can't just like hope that um, you're gonna surround your students with a certain type of input and without any kind of intervention, learning is going to happen. This is true more for certain features of language than others. So you may, with a very low degree of uh, noticing or attending to input, you may find that some vocabulary is learned. But if you start talking about grammatical items, like morphemes, like things that are more subtle, you, you need that. You, you definitely need some intervention. You definitely need to do something to focus your students' attention um, within that input so that you can maximize what they can learn or you can maximize what they can understand and therefore what they can learn, okay? So at that point is when you start going back to this and going like, well, maybe not mission accomplished, right? Maybe it took a ton of work to identify a text that you could bring to class and was authentic. Maybe it took even more time to make sure that you modify it in a way that doesn't kind of like gut it from any kind of value, linguistic value for your students. But maybe, maybe if it is the case that exposure alone to input it is not sufficient, is necessary, but not sufficient. Maybe this is when you start thinking about, well, what am I gonna ask them to do with that super authentic text that I so painstakingly prepared for them? Yeah, again, so uh, it, it is when you notice that when you kind of like reflect upon the fact that exposure is necessary, but not at all sufficient, that you start thinking about, okay, what, how am I going to, uh, elicit paying attention and to what parts of this text. And I feel like that sometimes is not quite as intuitive. Where, whereas in my experience with, with practitioners, everyone is very much aware of the need for authenticity in their sources of input. And whereas the, the notion that you shouldn't be too invasive and definitely you shouldn't like get in there, roll up your sleeves and take a bunch of things out because you interfere with that authenticity. Where, whereas that is, in my opinion, in my experience, fairly uh, common. Then the notion that whatever it is that you create in order to get your students to interact or engage with that text, I don't feel like we pay so much attention to that latter portion. I feel like after that, we're somewhat, um, I don't know if less intuitive or you're spent because at that point you just don't have anything left to, to give or whether it is an interaction of both. Here's some more, a few more things that we know from working memory research. So this is not research necessarily that, that is conducted to inform the classroom, but it is about cognition. And sometimes they leave us with snippets that are very, very informative for us. So a major part of language learning is the learning of sequences. And by sequences, they mean longer strings of language, which you definitely find in an authentic text whether it is in an audio text or, 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 or a text, a written text. Okay, but th this brings home the idea of like, you should be aiming for longer chunks. Okay, whatever that means at this point. And then short-term rehearsal of sequences of both strings of language promotes the consolidation of long-term memories. So that means that perhaps Rehearsal, in this case, in this study, it was like repetition, verbal repetition. But what, what this, I think also, and definitely the study uh, supported th this idea, what this kind of brings home is that repeated processing of strings of language, not a word, not two words, strings of language with elements that are connected to one another is necessary. And it's, it's good or is positive for learning because it means that you, you maintain a certain amount of linguistic information in your short-term memory, which opens up the door for the possibility that that may 
one day be part of your long-term memory. Okay, but these two things, this apparently from the more cognitive and psychology oriented of um, um, literature in, in second language acquisition, this is what, what, we, what we're told or what we learn. So that idea of like repeated processing of strings of language maybe is beneficial for, for learners to actually acquire language. Now from the second language reading research, also kind of cognitive, not so much research conducted in order for um, instructed second language acquisition to be better in any way. We know that reading goals affect the sorts of information our learners process. So if you're hoping for your learners to take a string of language and go back and forth and process it back and forth, it matters what you're asking them to do. You know, when you put it that way, it makes a lot of sense. For example, in, in the study, in this study that, that uh, this information comes from, translation turned out to um, elicit focusing on linguistic structures, like more on grammar structures. I'm not recommending translation as a means of language acquisition, but they had, they had that as part of their, um, as part of their um, operationalization of reading goals, and that's what they found. And then the counterpart to that was the comprehension questions placed more of a focus on meaning, which I think is more of interest to us, right? The idea is like, we wanna focus on meaning so that they can uh, get better about communication. And the, you know, if we kind of start accumulating snippets, well, only a portion of what you're gonna expose them to is going to be understood and only a portion of that is going to be learned. And if you want them to learn, you probably are gonna go chunk. You wanna strive for processing and repeated processing of chunks. And you probably want to pay attention to how you're gonna elicit that processing because certain things are going to cause them to get all hung up on grammar, whereas others are gonna cause them to get more focused or more hang up on meaning, which is arguably more of interest to us. And this comes from a 2012 study. Again, not one necessarily intended to inform the classroom, but perhaps it does anyway. And so in light of this, when we think about, okay, now I have this authentic text, what, what should I do with it, if anything? Like what beyond having an authentic text should I do? I think we should be very, very mindful of the fact that what we ask our students to do with the text will modulate whatever they can learn from it. And then comprehension questions are gonna trigger Reader, we should probably strive for comprehension questions that trigger reading and rereading of language sequences. If language sequences are necessary for language learning to happen, then we want to have questions that make it a must for our students to go back to the text and process that information time and again. And then finally, it's sort of the same point, but comprehension questions that promote maintenance of language sequences in your short-term memory, that's probably what we're looking for. Can we create that kind of a situation with comprehension questions? I don't know. So, so, so what are you going to require your students to do with authentic input? I mean, I've been talking forever and a day by now. And so here, what I would like, what I would like to do is, I'm gonna give you a couple of, questions with translations and hopefully hopefully you you can remember or know enough about uh, what the text says that you can tell me why I prefer question this question in blue to the question that has the ALT on it so I always give you a question and then an alternate alternative or a couple of alternatives I'm telling you you know right off the bat to me the ones that don't carry that ALT the, the non-alternative ones they're better but I'm curious to, to hear whether you share that or whether that resonates with you or whether it at least makes sense in light of what we just heard from, from the SLA research. And so for example, here, question one, as, it, as we tend to do, you know, is about the, this first paragraph. I think we all tend to do this as well, kind of like order the, the questions in the same uh, sequence that the information appears in the text. And question one would be like, students are uh, use physical activity to combat the nerves and tension from their studies. Okay. All right. And the second one would be, uh, sports are not popular activities to combat stress. And so then, again, I mean, I prefer the first one. It's a false question. It would have a justification. 
And I don't know if anyone would have any kind of insights as to why would one of these questions be more favorable than the other? I like that it starts with los estudiantes, right? So it starts with this, we're focusing, we're narrowing it for them. Okay. It, it's kind of parallel to the text, right? So entre estudiantes, um, kind of like guiding them. Yeah. And I personally don't like the no question, like in the alternate, because it sort of um, requires even more processing on their part. Um, I mean, it's a double negative. There's always like the whole like, okay, is this correct or not not correct, right? And right. so, okay, so that's one thing. It's it's kind of like the no questions. I don't love them either. I feel like sometimes we skip the no when we read fast. Yeah, because okay. just that one tiny word is gonna throw them off, right? So yeah. Any any other any other like reasons why you know mm, this first one maybe maybe preferable or maybe you don't share that. It it yeah. um it requires them to actually understand the sentence rather than just recognize the words because you have to like right. stress you have to be able to understand that that is the same thing as para convertir los nervios en la tensión rather than just recognize that the words are the same yeah so that's sort of like uh my my inkling as well in that um, and so my 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 organized uh, animations kind of gave me away here because what I think number one uh, does, that number one alt doesn't is that number one requires going back and forth between items from the formulation like you know los estudiantes usan actividad física para combatir is there anything that that carries that sense of combating here okay what am I matching it to so you're going and processing and reprocessing the formulation of the question and processing and reprocessing a chunk of text to see if there's actually a parallel there. And there are a number of items, in my opinion, that are gonna require you to do that, the notion of combating, okay? Which here is like liberating stress. So it's, you know, um, accessible enough, but yet not quite the same word as Jamie said, not requiring something beyond looking uh, at, uh, whether, looking at whether this, the words are the same. Um, you had two and, hands up. Brady and, and Vianne had two hands up. Okay, okay, perfect. So yeah, go ahead. But I mean, just to finish that thought, same thing with uh, los nervios y la tensión. So you need to sort of like match that to stress, which I don't think is a tall ask, but it does require some going back and forth between the two um, strings of of language and then Vianney and, and Brady, you guys are welcome uh, to ask. I think Brady was first. Um, so my, my comment was just, um, Lori, I thought it was interesting um, that you said that the, the first question was very guiding to the students um, because um, I, I agree, um, but I, I guess I wanted to just point out that um, like it was guiding in the sense that it forced the students to look at the full sentence and like the full paragraph if, if they were taking um, like a estudiante as the cue. Um, whereas the second question seemed like you could just read the, the, the like second half of the sentence and not really understand the full thought. Yeah. Um, so. yeah I, mean, I think there's something to that. Like I don't, if normally with these questions, well, we call them reading comprehension questions. So we're trying to gauge comprehension. And I think with the, with the first one, you do a lot more of that than with the second. With the second is more identification, I think. You don't, you don't raise to that level of comprehension. Um, but I mean, I, I do feel like sometimes because you are exhausted, because you don't know what to ask anymore, because if this is an exam, if it is not a practice activity for your class, with a practice activity, you have more leeway. But if it is an exam, you're so worried about being unfair that you sometimes end up veering and, and gravitating towards questions that really are not very informative as to how much they have understood or comprehended. You know, just to save yourself from being unfair to them or, to, or you know, put it in whatever way you want, your own pushback from, from a bad exam. So, so yeah, so that's, the, I, would, I would agree with that. And so I think, that in the second, with the second question, you sort of like, first off, require them to identify whether the presence of the negative is there or not. Oh, it's not there. And then the rest of the things, 
look the same, so it must be false because this one says no about all of these things that here are not said no about. Okay. And, you know, I don't know, but maybe, I don't know, maybe you can tell me like, I don't know, is one alt a realistic question or does that come from a puppet, you know, that has no heart anymore and is not a practitioner? I'd like to think that that it's not common, but then I think it is common, particularly in, in commercial textbooks. Sometimes they kind of water down those questions because they have to be one size fits all, I would imagine. And so you don't get a lot of um, benefit from them. Okay, was there, a, I think it was something in the chat, but I, did I address that already? Oh, Jamie, okay, she had to go. Okay, perfect. And so what else? So another one. And again, you know, I'm giving, giving it away right away um, that I prefer the one in blue, right? So the aptitudes needed to do physical activity interfere with memory and studying. And then the other two are running is good for concentration or swimming is good for concentration. I don't know if you have any thoughts or anything. Can I can I actually ask a question? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm just curious, like what um, what level this text would be used for, um, and what sort of percentage of the vocabulary in the text the students would already ha have been exposed to in some sort of formal way. Um, and I ask because um, I just I, I I'm sensing that the challenges um, for teaching authentic texts really vary when. Like maybe there's a lot more flexibility when you're teaching English featured Spanish because there's so many cognates. Yeah. Um, whereas um, other languages, there are virtually none. And so that becomes a much different, like the questions are much more focused on the, the set of vocabulary they're expected to already know. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's good that, that you are asking this question. One, I 100% agree that how much, um, Modific modification you have to do on an authentic text varies on a function of how much similarity you have between the two languages, right? How much can can your students be expected to sort of glean from the uh, authentic text based on knowledge they already have, namely the native language, probably. Um, this is a text that we use currently in Spanish 120. So Spanish one, but I'll tell you also that this is like in chapter two of, of like our newly adopted volume. And I can tell you that we we had to like practice CPR on a couple of students. So it's not an easy text. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, <laughs> it was it was a bit shocking, right? It captured their attention. It is very, very reliant on cognates, uh, but it is not one that goes down super easily. You know, I feel like we do this in chapter two and then we do it again in three and in four and in five, but in three and in four and in five, they don't even bat an eyelash, okay? One, they've gotten used to us being not entirely gentle. Two, they have more, you know, bootstrapping ability at that point. But yes, 100% in agreement with the fact that you get away with a lot more and you can do a lot more a lot faster when you can rely on comments, yeah. Um, and then about uh, vocabulary. So if, if we look at the second alternative question here, that is, I see this a lot also. Okay, so we have an authentic text that we're bringing to class because we're probably dealing with a certain topic. Oh, this is great to talk about or to work on. And so we have a, an item, a number of uh, said vocabulary items that we're hoping for them to learn. And so this is what this question typically does. Oh, I want you to learn correr, running. I also want you to learn nadar. So this doesn't test your, your comprehension at all really, but I'm happy-ish with it because at least I know whether you know this word. But it's a fallacy, right? If you're hoping, if you go back to this idea that learning language requires keeping these longer strings of sentence, of, of language, longer strings you know, um, of, of language in your head and processing that back and forth so that you can sort of play with the relationship between the elements that come from that string. This doesn't do anything for you, nothing, nothing at all. I mean, I agree that it does something, you're testing some vocabulary, but it doesn't, for language learning purposes, it's not doing much for you. It's giving you one tiny item. There's none of that string 
comprehension string maintenance in short-term memory that, that those cognitive studies were sort of like pitching at us, not a lot. Um, and then correr is bueno para la concentración, running is good for concentration. I think you know it's kind of the same thing as we saw with the first question. It's a lot more identification, you know, and, and kind of like going back to see if you find these, these elements pervading in the text, are they mentioned? Then it must be correct. Yeah. Okay. And I see VNA and then Sandra also um, had questions. Yes. I think you, uh, you touched a little bit on what I was going to say earlier, which is um, I, I think it's nice that it's um, the sentence in the blue one, the, the sample. The first one is um, uses a lot of cognates in, in a longer string of a sentence. Uh, and it's nice that it's um, comprehension of a written text because if students were to hear it, even though it's very similar, they wouldn't catch it. But since they have time to look at it and look at it again, um, use what they know in their first language or in English in this case, might not be the first language, but in English. And um, the other thing that I was gonna say about the um, second, um, the dip, what I like about the first versus the second question is that in the second question, um, I'm starting to think of how students may be tempted to answer based on personal knowledge of something. Yeah versus um, actually understanding, because even myself, you know, it's 4 p.m. and I may be a little tired to be thinking, it's making me, as I'm looking at the example, think, um, as I'm looking at um, and try to process the meaning of um, that specific part of that second paragraph that you have um, in, the sec in that sample question or sentence versus the second one, I feel like I would be tempted to just like use my knowledge to answer. Yeah. And, and that happens a lot also, although I don't think necessarily, sometimes we don't notice we're, we're doing that because we're at least on a personal level, I feel like I'm so focused on the text that I don't go that extra step and I'm not like, okay, you could answer this without reading because it's common sense or it's common, or at least this knowledge that we all share. Yeah, so that happens sometimes, yeah. And I think it is, the case for, to be fair, with all three questions here, although in the case of two at the bottom, it is more obviously so. Like there's such simple questions that I think, you know, yeah, it is more the case, but this one as well. I mean, I think that anyone with a little common sense, if they have to venture a guess, they would say, no, no, sports do not interfere with your memory and studying. I, I don't know, I could be wrong about that. But yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, and so, but the idea again is that whereas this one here would require you to read this a bunch of times and then see about the correspondence between the items mentioned in here and the, the part of the text that you identify as containing the answer to it. Again, that idea of like swishing back and forth strings of language, authentic language or semi-authentic language, and the, the notion of that being lost in the case of the latter two, because you can just sort of like check for, oh, this is here, this, Ideal, bueno, okay, a very low level of sort of like uh, matching required there. Very, very cognate and very, very transparent cognates at it. And this one is just, you know, this one is the less, in my opinion, virtuous of them all. This is like, you, that's a vocabulary question that is not a reading comprehension question. And it's definitely not one that is gonna require, um, that is gonna yield any kind of like, benefit being gleaned from the fact that you brought them an authentic text. You're going, you're wasting the fact that you spent all of that time working on that authentic text, pre preserving it, you know, making sure that those qualities that you wanted it for are still there while still supporting comprehension. All right, one more. Uh, no, this one, there you go. I think um, Sandra, Sandra also had oh, a question. Sorry, I forgot. No, so, I, what I was thinking, sorry, it was just that it's um, the students have to process the information from a different perspective with the blue questions. I see it kind yeah. of like if X equals Y and S equals Y, then does X equal S or something like that? A hundred percent. Yeah, you're, you're sort of requiring um, certain extrapolation, first interpretation of the text and then interpretation of the question and then aligning those to see if, if there's a match. Yeah. yeah, so they have to process and in order to process, they're probably rereading and discussing or just rereading and seeing where it matches or doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, what I what I, I mean, I love that comment because some people take that to be a good feature in a text. Some mm -hmm. people take that to be a bad feature in a text. So mm -hmm. if you take this notion 
that, oh, but then your students don't understand. There are certain people that, that fear errors in language learning. Language learning is a, is a hypothesis testing process, right? There's gonna be errors. So if this is for class, you're there, you're the facilitator, right. you know, guide them through it instead of being scared about the fact that they're not gonna immediately understand. If they're immediately understanding, then there's probably nothing being added to their language representation. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like some people view that as, oh yeah, I, I wanna strive for that in the practice that I bring to class. And some other people are more like uptight about it. Now, if we make a differentiation between this being class practice or an exam, that gets right. excavated. In an exam, I think we're all a lot more afraid of like taking these kinds of risks. And these questions are one, going to take a lot more of your time and energy to come up with. And two, are a lot very riskier. You may find a lot more students going like, okay, but the text doesn't say so, but I don't agree. And so, you know, at the end of the day, after you've already spent a ton of your time looking for the text, modifying the text, if on top of it, all you're gonna get is grieve, then you go for this. I feel like that happens a lot, yeah. And okay. also not just student pushback, but this whole time during this activity, I'm wondering about time, right? If this is for a first semester class and it's an assess a timed assessment, um, I'm not worried about what they're going to argue with me about. What I'm worried is, that, do they really have the time to go back and do those multiple layers of processing? Um, and are they all going to be doing it in the same time? They're not, right? Some are going to be faster, some are going to be slower. So sort of how do you reconcile the issue of time if you're doing a timed assessment? With, with these texts, and as you probably know, we do a, a double layer, right? You assign them as homework with different questions so that they start massaging the text and then you hit them away again with alternate questions that are arguably harder and kind of build on what they did the night before. But yeah, it's, it's a, like a whole production and dovetailing. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, I mean, we're, we're language instructors, so we know these abundantly, but there's no glory in this work. <laughs> no, your students are not going to be like, my gosh, are you good at what you do? And your dean isn't going to do that either. <laughs> Nobody's going to do that. And your spouse, maybe if you chose it well, maybe will be like throwing you some some uh, manner of praise. But it's 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 not very common to to get any kind of feedback about this. Um, I, so now for an open-ended question, right? So let's let's go for 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 example, according to the text. Uh, why is ballet a less recommendable activity for students? As opposed to my not so favorite one, what activities that the, does the text recommend to combat stress? Which this is a super common activity, so, um, super common question. And you know, this is when I get blitzed by lightning and don't get out of this room ever, but it's a very actual question. It's like, oh, leave them room to tell you what they know, okay. Maybe that's too much room, or do you guys not agree? Oh, totally agree. I mean, the second one is just like recognition of vocabulary and then no production at all. By just bringing up, lifting the three words you need, you already answered that question and that's all you need, right? The second, the first one. I mean, I feel like you are asking for some comprehension, but you're asking for comprehension of, of isolated elements it's a very low bar as far as you know you and know you can just lift the words and you have to answer you don't even need to produce a full sentence as i can just copy down ballet and that and you're done right the second I one, mean, the first one are you simplification. Well, this one you would have to you would have to have understood that it's it's not being recommended by the text okay there's a little bit of a caveat there's some triaging of whether you understood something or not um but I, I don't like the, well, first, if you go back to that idea of like switching strings of language back and forth as a form of learning or as a form of upping how much uptake you glean from that authentic text, this one doesn't get you any of that. But also, you know, this question doesn't require the, uh, the comprehension of any connection between anything that comes after any of these items. Like the rest of the text might, might as well not be there. With these kinds of questions, you might as well not even bother maintaining any of those features that authenticity brings with them. You could simplify the, the, the entire text, go back to that very simple version that contains no features of interest, and it wouldn't matter because you're not 
you're not asking your students to do anything with all of those features that you've left there and that the text probably contained and that they, they normally would encounter in a native interaction or with a native, um, natively oriented um, source. So, so I want to jump in and say that that um, the, the question that we don't like um, looks a lot like the questions um, that uh, we tend to use in like a first semester Arabic class. And the logic has always been that the like the, the access to cognates or to the limited vocabulary they have is really low and that it's it's teaching basically getting comfortable with authentic texts and being okay with only understanding 30%. Does that does that logic hold to you or do you think that there's a, a more I mean, complex way that we could be um, asking our students to interact with these sorts of things? I don't, I don't think I'll venture guess about a language like Arabic. <laughs> I, I know too little about it. I mean, the alphabet is different. So you're already sort of like asking them to work on that level. So there's some degree of like, um, um, comprehension, you know, or at least decoding and processing that you do not have when you're dealing with a Western language like Spanish. Um, and, and so I, and also this is a judgment free zone, you know, I'm telling you which ones are my favorite and not for the reasons that I think resonate with me, but the intention is never to go like, you should do this, you should do that. To me, the, the, the main driving point is you took all this work with, with the authentic text, take you're going to have to take more work with, so that you you actually get something out of all that work you put in before that that's where i feel like um we don't get hammered over the head so much with with that latter point so but um i am sure that if you rack your brains enough you probably find a way to go beyond the you know isolated element level whether you choose to do that or not it's it, it depends you know, you know better than anybody else what you can require of them. And like I said, I mean, this, if you ask my students about this text, they barf. They don't like this text. They do not appreciate that we're doing this to them. They get really scared and uptight. And, you know, there's a ton of people writing a ton of dissertations about language anxiety and how it interferes with learning. So you would find a ton of people kind of opposed or going like, you know, maybe this is not the, the way to go. I, people who work with me know that... <laughs> It's a pet peeve when I can go a little further, particularly if it's in class and not in an exam, I tend to want to do that. But, um, and there's such a thing as, as overdoing it. You know, you, you saw me point out a bunch of like a positives in this authentic text. Um, I want to take them out. <laughs> I mean, we have them in our book right now. And upon implementing this for the first time, some of them, I was like, you know, yeah, not so many of them. And, and if, uh, if for it, I'm simplifying and sacrificing some of that authenticity, I believe that, that in this case, it is justified. So it's, it's a judgment call. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I don't think I have anything else other than thank you for enduring this and for participating. And if there are any remaining questions that you wanna discuss, like I'll be super happy to, to do that. And if not, Thank you so much and amazing that you guys made it at 4 p.m. <laughs> in week 11. Or, or even worse, I don't know where, where everyone is. I, I was curious about something about what Brady said about his Arabic. Sorry, there's like children screaming in the background. But um, um, do your students in a first semester Arabic class respond in writing in, on the exam in Arabic? Like yeah, of course. So, so I'm wondering if is it ever appropriate to respond in English? Um, also, a very actual thing, yes. right? So, like <laughs> you're only focusing on the comprehension and not necessarily on the production in that language, right? Because I'm assuming that's going to take longer than like our Spanish students who are going to be able to sort of like copy words here and there. Um, so, yeah, I guess just what is the yeah that's a good I, I you know that's interesting i've done that with um with listening exams um and and maybe the the, the principle holds i've uh for for reading as well that's a good suggestion and i just i wonder i guess goretti like is that okay is that yeah i mean is it I think um, sometimes it is called for 
I mean, if you purely want to gauge comprehension, it's a matter of isolating variables, right? If you really want to gauge comprehension, putting what they have understood through the limited proficiency they have, I don't think you want to do that. It's just that I guess um, where, where I may per part ways with a lot of people is that I believe that you can, at least for Spanish, mm, rely enough on cognates that sometimes you get you may not get so much of that second language effect that you may still give in, be giving them a fair chance at expressing how much they understood or nearly all of it without asking them to answer in English. And, and then there are practicalities. You know that students as humans that they are tend to get used to what's more comfortable and then they don't wanna get out of that. And so if you can help exacerbating that that very human instinct like I don't say with any kind of you know I'm not trying to be judgy I would do the same thing so then you don't get them used to that you do the opposite you you do CPR and then by chapter three you're happy you did if for whoever survived okay. yeah all right Merce is this it should we like it is I just want to share um the link to our website, because I don't know if you know that all the talks that we were going to have are going to be up there listed. And my, we're also posting the slides and the videos, the recordings of the sessions that we have. So if you want to have a second look or go back, you can always do that. Or you can recommend it to other people too. You know, if you know someone that couldn't be here uh, and you think this would be helpful, um, please share the website. All that information will be up there later on. But I think that's it from us. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank, thank you, you very much for having me and thank you for, for coming and for the discussion. You have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye.